from coffee found to coffee created, Starbucks. As far as coffee is concerned, Starbucks is the first to come to mind. Several die-hard fans and customers support the company. Starbucks may be available at every strategic intersection in your area. The stores are packed with regulars as the brand is known for its wonderful coffee experience and ethos. Starbucks has gone from one coffee bean shop in Seattle to a sprawling $80 billion corporation over the last 50 years, largely thanks to its iconic cups adorned with misspelled names, which reflect the culture and values of the company and its products. Despite consumers' changing tastes, Starbucks has remained a constant. With nearly 32,000 coffee houses worldwide, more than half of them are in the United States, making it the largest coffee house chain globally. But where exactly did it come from? Jerry Baldwin, former English teacher, Zev Siegel, former history teacher, and Gordon Boker, a former writer, three former students of the University of San Francisco, founded Starbucks in 1971. Originally, they intended to sell high-quality coffee beans and roasting equipment, but they didn't anticipate the success that took place in the future. Their mentor was Alfred Peet, founder of Peet's Coffee, and the first person in the U.S. to roast coffee on demand. According to Zev Siegel, he also knew a great deal about the gourmet end of the coffee industry. In those days, he was the most educated person in the country when it came to coffee. So, on March 30th, 1971, the three friends, along with Pete's help, opened Starbucks, a coffee shop and roastery in Seattle's famous Pike Place Market. Until the young entrepreneurs could establish their own roastery and source their own beans, Pete provided them with coffee beans and connected them to coffee brokers. Initially, Starbucks drew inspiration from two sources, a character named Starbuck in the classic book Moby Dick, and a mining camp called Starbo at the foot of Mount Rainier. A combination of these two influences led to the creation of Starbucks. Now, originally, Starbucks coffee houses looked very different from what we know today. Zev wore a grocer's apron, and a complimentary tasting was served in porcelain cups outside the store, which evoked the feeling of a real merchant shop. With this commitment to detail and preservation of age-old tradition, Jerry said of the shop, we don't manage it to maximize anything except the quality of the coffee. According to him, in this way, they could maintain the integrity of the coffee. The store eventually gained a devoted community of loyal patrons who enjoyed the stories and mystery associated with each roast. As soon as Starbucks opened its doors in Seattle in 1971, the founders realized it would need a great logo. Their goal was to capture both the maritime history and Seattle's own affinity for the sea. So they searched old marine books until they discovered a 16th century Norse wooden carving of a siren with two tails. Starbucks used this image to create the first version of its logo. As the company has evolved, the first two elements of the logo have remained unchanged, with the two-tailed siren occupying the center stage. Modern coffee consumers might have noticed a notable absence at this point of actual coffee drinks. It's been said that the coffee culture of the 1970s was largely confined to the home. Neither coffee bars and cafes were to be found, nor were espresso-based drinks popular. People did not think that they would get a drink in a Starbucks coffee store until after 1980. At first, Starbucks focused its efforts on bringing premium beans to consumers who were used to having instant or canned coffee. However, that changed when one man was added to the team. Sales representative Howard Schultz of Hammerplast, a Swedish company that provides Starbucks with drip coffee makers, took note of the company's large orders and decided to visit the company. After being impressed with Starbucks, Schultz decided he would pursue a career at the coffee chain, and he was hired as its head of marketing in 1982. It was Schultz's observation that some first-time customers felt uneasy in the company's stores due to insufficient knowledge of fine coffees. So he trained employees on customer-friendly sales skills and created brochures that made learning about the company's products easier. Creating cafes that are solo-friendly was important to him. Round tables were used so that customers did not feel alone. In the first 10 years of business, the founders opened five more locations. Schultz came up with his most influential idea for Starbucks' future during a trip to Milan in the spring of 1983. Having been impressed with the country's cafes, 
he thought Starbucks should follow a similar trend. Now, Baldwin and Boker did not like Schultz's idea, since they did not want Starbucks to become a coffee shop that serves espressos and cappuccinos, but rather remain strictly a coffee shop and equipment dealer. Both wanted Starbucks to remain close to its traditional business model. When Schultz realized that he would not be able to convince Baldwin and Boker that cafes were a good idea, he left Starbucks in 1985. He started a coffee chain called Il Giornale, which became an instant success, soon expanding nationwide. After a few years, as soon as Baldwin and Boker decided to sell Starbucks, Schultz, who was only 34 at the time, snapped it up and bought Starbucks for $3.8 million. Bill Gates Sr., the late father of the Microsoft co-founder, has helped Howard Schultz with some financial support to buy Starbucks back. Gates Sr. told Howard, You'll be the owner of this company and you'll fulfill your dream. Both my son and I will help you. After establishing itself in Chicago and Vancouver, Starbucks expanded to California, Washington, D.C., and New York within a few years. In 1997, they crossed the Pacific Ocean to open a store in Japan. European stores followed in 1998 and Chinese stores in 1999. As they flourished for the next two decades, they welcomed millions of customers every week, becoming an integral part of neighborhoods worldwide. From this sense of good taste and good spending, the Starbucks coffee cup and logo soon appeared in film and television. The Starbucks cup was consumed by Carrie Bradshaw in Sex and the City, and Andrea may have brought it in every morning to her evil boss in The Devil Wears Prada. Every action they took was focused on one mission, to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one neighbor, one person, and one cup at a time. Howard writes in his book, Onward, success is not sustainable if it is measured only by how big I become. A large number that once attracted me, 40,000 stores, is no longer relevant. There is only one number that matters, one. One partner, one client, and one cup. Get to know one experience at a time. Maintaining consistency across all its stores and products is a critical aspect of the company's business model. In February 2008, around 135,000 baristas were trained at more than 7,000 Starbucks stores in the United States as part of Starbucks' Espresso Excellence Training. The renowned coffee company is well known for its expertise in marketing. But it was also one of the first companies to fully embrace the digital age, selling coffees through their app and even selling gift cards through a Twitter hashtag. On top of their success, they also became the first brand to reach 10 million likes on Facebook. Those were impressive numbers at the time. In addition, Starbucks is committed to being a responsible and ethical company. Additionally, this involves creating opportunities through education, training, employment, and responsible purchasing practices. As part of its efforts to reduce its environmental carbon footprint, Starbucks also initiates energy and water conservation programs and recycling and green construction programs. In 1995, a program called Ground for Your Garden allowed the baristas to collect used coffee grounds and give them to customers free of charge for personal composting or gardening purposes. Not just this, to reward people who bring their own reusable cups, Starbucks has also been offering a 10 cent discount since 1985. There are also initiatives underway for adding more plant-based foods to its menu, making packaging reusable instead of single use, investing in innovative farming practices, water conservation, and forest protection to replenish its supply chains. By ensuring better waste management, they minimize food waste and maximize reuse and recycling, eco-friendly manufacturing, shipping, and store operations. Now some fun facts. Number one. The CIA headquarters in the USA hosts a secret Starbucks. All Starbucks baristas undergo a thorough background check and special training. The other amazing thing about them is that they don't even use names at all. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Number two, in the Starbucks world, a black apron signifies that the barista is not an amateur, but is a master trained coffee maker. Number three, can you guess how many times a regular customer visits Starbucks in a month? The answer is around 16 times, roughly every other day. Number four, if it's grand, it's Starbucks. The company bought a personal record label named Hear Music in 2007. And number five, the popularity of Starbucks was so great that it opened two stores a day on average for almost 20 years. 
As the world's leading roaster and retailer of specialty coffee, Starbucks operates in more than 250 stores in Manhattan alone, and almost 32,600 globally, according to 2020 data. With every cup, they aim to offer both an exceptional experience and a passion for their heritage. This was the story of a few men who took their lives into their own hands, grabbed every opportunity they got, and built a successful life step by step. How would you describe your story? This brings us to the end of the video, so if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. Make sure to subscribe to our channel in order to stay informed about our future videos. And don't forget to mention your favorite Starbucks drinks.